Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is John Davis. He's a Wild Ways scout and advocate who served as editor of Wild Earth in the 1990s, program officer of the Foundation for Deep Ecology in the early 2000s, and conservation director of Adirondack Council till 2010. He has since been working with Wildlands Network and Rewilding Institute, trekking and writing and speaking about the proposed eastern and western wildways. So first, thank you so much for your work, and thank you for being with me on this program. Thank you, Derek. It's an honor to be here. Oh, thank you. Um, so one of the things that you're known for is for um, the uh, Wild Earth magazine and also the larger – oh, shoot. Now, of course, I'm forgetting. What was the name of the organization that was be- behind that? The, the wild, It was originally called the Wildlands Project, and a few years ago we renamed it the Wildlands Network. Okay, so that's um, that's one of the things you're known for. And can you talk about that and its emphasis on wildlife corridors and what it was about, what it is about, and why it's important? Sure. Yeah, Wild Earth was essentially the voice or the publication of the Wildlands Project, recently renamed the Wildlands Network. And Wild Earth served in part to, to bridge the gap between conservation activists and conservation biologists, a small group of us, including Dave Foreman, Reed Noss, uh, Mary Bird Davis, who's my mother, David Johns, and a few others, co-founded Wild Earth in the beginning of the 1990s. We wanted to make conservation biology accessible to conservation activists so they'd be more grounded, more informed in their resistance work, if you will, in their work to defend wild places and to advocate for expanding and reconnecting wild places. And then about a year later, the same group of us with an additional dozen or so folks, including the great wildlands philanthropist Doug Tompkins, who actually pulled us together, and Jerry Mander, and uh, some Canadian conservationists, Jim Eaton of California Wilderness Coalition, Jamie Sine from New Hampshire, and a few others, gathered at Doug Tompkins' house in California, I think this was 1992, and co-founded the Wildlands Project. And the Wildlands Project was a short name for the North American Wilderness Recovery Strategy. And the premise of the organization and the premise of its magazine, Wild Earth, also, was that it's not enough to protect isolated pockets of nature. We really need to protect huge wild areas and connect these wild areas with wildlife corridors. And why is that? Many reasons. And the conservation biologists involved in Wild Earth and the Wildlands Project, like Michael Soule and Reed Noss and John Turborg and Jim Estes and others, can explain it more expertly than I can. But from a layperson's perspective, I often say there are five really big basic reasons why animals need room to roam, why they need wildlife habitat connections or wildlife corridors. Um, One being food, because many animals need to range widely over the course of the year to find different food items. They may, bears, for instance, may eat uh, greenery, um, succulent vegetation during spring when the the, the vegetation is fresh. They may switch to more berries as summer proceeds, and then in the autumn they may switch to acorns and beech nuts. And these different foods may be at different elevations or in different locations, so the bears have to wander to find these different food items. They may scavenge throughout the part of the year when they're not hibernating. And then, of course, in winter, in northern areas anyway, bears typically hibernate. And that may take them to yet a different location, sometimes, ironically, actually a higher location where they can be in a, in, um, underneath the snow in a spruce fur thicket. So many animals, but particularly the large mammals and the migratory birds, have to range very widely to meet their needs for different food items. Another reason is cover or shelter. Animal, um, just like us, just like people, uh, most animals need shelter at various times, shelter from heat, shelter from wind, shelter from cold, shelter from rain. Cover is, an, is, cover is an, a, partly a synonym for shelter, but it also implies cover for, as in escape cover, a place of hiding from predators. So, again, many animals need to range or roam to find different types of cover for different for different seasons and to escape from different predators. Another reason is um, genes or genetic diversity. If in isolated populations where the animals cannot roam widely, inbreeding depression occurs. Just if you imagine 
a human community, if people never traveled, if it was a small town and everybody just stayed there all the time, it would end up being a rather unhealthy place because uh, mates would not be able to find uh, people would not be able to find mates from outside the, the population, and inbreeding depression could occur. That's the same with wild animals. Uh, uh, another uh, related to that, sex, and um, we all want it. Some creatures have to travel a great distance to find it, and again, it's important that. Um, that animals be able to find mates who are not closely related so that inbreeding depression doesn't follow. It's important that um, the, the genes from different populations mix. And it's simply important that animals be able to move a long distance to be able to find mates. Sometimes cougars and bears and wolves and other wide-ranging species have to travel scores or even hundreds of miles to find a mate. And if there's a road in their way or if there's a city in their way, uh, they may not be able to find another mate. And then finally, change. And um, change is an especially important factor now that human beings are rapidly changing the climate. In this century of climate chaos, it will be ever more important that animals be able to move upward in elevation or northward in latitude to be able to track their climate envelopes and stay with the, the, um, the species with which they've evolved. So those are five basic reasons why habitat connections are very important. And there's a lot of literature about this. There are books by Reed Noss and Michael Soule and Dave Foreman and Christina Eisenberg and others who, that explain in great detail why wildlife corridors and habitat connectivity in general are very important. And, you know, I think about that last reason a lot. And there's a lot we can talk about with all that stuff, but I think about the last reason a lot whenever I think about the mass extinctions, the prior mass extinctions, because every... Every major mass extinction, except maybe one, but I think every major mass extinction has been associated with rapid climate change. And um, a difference, one of the many differences between now and then is that at that point, um, ant plants and animals could um, flee northward. Um, there was no such thing as a wildlife corridor because everywhere was habitat. Right. And now... Um, they don't have that at all, which makes, you know, add on everything else that's terrible about this culture. And that's one more reason that this current mass extinction is even more dreadful. That's well, that's well said, Derek. I strongly agree with that. And, and that the previous extinction episodes, the four or five previous extinction episodes have been associated with changing climate is, is of course, as you say, it's a, it's a warning that the way we're pushing climate beyond the bounds of where it's ever been in, in measured history is frightening. It, it, we are almost certainly going to greatly accelerate an extinction crisis that we had already begun before we started pushing the climate out of control. And, and as, as you say also, yeah, the wolves and the bears and the, and the salmon and the, and the eagles and the falcons and, and salamanders and frogs, and all, they can't simply move to new habitat now because we have we have damaged or destroyed so much of the terrestrial and aquatic habitats all over the world so there are not that many new places animals can move so you know one of the ways i think about um so i want to i'm going to say one of the ways i think about this whole question of of sort of island ecology and then after i say that can you talk about can you talk a little bit more i mean you've said this but talk just a little bit more specifically about what this means. I think about this all the time because where I live, I live in, in um, temperate rainforest, Northern California, redwood forest, and there's a lot of banana slugs everywhere. And I live at sort of the, I live in its town of maybe 5,000 people at the edge of it, right next to a salmon bearing stream. But in the other direction, you know, there's, there's houses. And so there's plenty of slugs right here, but of course, slugs have – it's almost impossible for a slug to cross any road whatsoever because they go so slow. And even if one person only drives every 10 minutes, it's still going to be a, a real crapshoot for it to get across. And so I think about even here, you know, these slugs are all then isolated populations between this little patch of forest and then this patch of forest that's simply separated by a, a um, suburban or – um, whatever the word is, road. Right. Yeah, it's a basic problem. Yeah. So different animals react in different ways to roads, but 
Roads are a problem, you know, arguably at least, roads are the single worst thing that humankind has done to nature. Building roads has just chopped the natural world into many smaller and smaller pieces. And in many cases, as you say, with the banana slugs, I don't know the genetics of banana slugs, of course, although I, I greatly admire banana slugs. I enjoy seeing them when I'm out in your area. Um, but th yeah, many, many populations are being isolated and starting to lose genetic diversity because of that. In some cases, it doesn't take all that many successful crossings of a barrier to restore that genetic diversity. And partly for that reason, uh, many conservation biologists and conservation activists are, argue, are arguing these days or urging decision makers to realize if we put safe wildlife crossings on roads, if we dismantle unneeded dams on rivers, if we close unneeded roads in the backcountry, we actually can ameli greatly ameliorate, ameliorate the, the effects of habitat fragmentation. It is possible to put, for instance, crossings over or under major highways, even interstate highways that allow wolves and bears and caribou and so forth to cross safely. This has been done successfully in some places, most famously in Banff National Park, Canada, where a series of tunnels under and bridges over the major east-west highway were put in place many years ago, and they have worked terrifically well. They apparently reduced the number of collisions between large animals and motorists, humans driving cars, by more than 90%. So I mean, it's, I, I, I don't think we should be building new roads anywhere, and I think we should be closing unneeded roads in the backcountry wherever we can. But most of our road infrastructure is probably going to remain open and functional for at least the f foreseeable future. So let's get safe wildlife crossings on these roads. It actually ends up saving human lives as, as well as wild animal lives. So another part of the um, – of the and I, I'm sorry if you mentioned this, but um, – Another part of the problem of isolated populations is that uh, populate is is that nature is never really um, static, and um, it is routine for a lot of creatures to suffer some sort of either local population crash or even a local extirpation, and then um, they need for creatures to come back in and refill but if you have barriers to movement um, that local extirpation becomes uh, permanent again you're exactly right Derek Reed Noss described this process or this problem of there's a big fancy word called stochasticity which basically means randomness as I understand it anyway and stochastic events in nature are those random disturbances that can wipe out small populations. Like a big hurricane or... Yeah, exactly. A big hurricane. A this big is flood or something. Big flood, big hurricane, big tornado, earthquake even. A major event like this, if it hits in, in a big wild area where there are plenty of animals and, and multiple populations that can restore each other in case one or more gets knocked out, it's not so bad. But if you have, a, say, a small remnant of old growth forest and it gets hit by a hurricane, it may blow down the whole forest and then you've completely lost that old growth forest. Or if there's a rare species in say the, the little bit uh, in a remnant of longleaf pine forest, longleaf pine forest is supposed to burn, longleaf pine forest is native in the southeast United States, it's supposed to burn fairly regularly but because of decades of fire suppression now they sometimes get unnaturally severe fires and if you have an unnaturally severe fire sweep through a remnant of longleaf pine forest. It might wipe out many of the sensitive plants in that forest. So yes, it's very. Reed, Reed Noss, I think, uses the term minimum dynamic area to mean the size of a wild, intact habitat needed to make sure that no one natural disturbance is going to wipe out all the uh, sensitive creatures within it. So one of the lines I remember reading by Dave Foreman was, I believe it was Dave Foreman, might have been you, was that one of the reasons for the existence of the Wildlands Network in the beginning was it was based on the premise that if you have enough habitat to support large predators, that um, this would mean that the smaller creatures would probably be also protected because for the most part they would require less habitat. That's right. Dave Foreman said that. I think Reed Noss and Michael Sule and John Turborg and others have also said it. The basic idea 
being this is sometimes uh, biologists and conservation leaders will speak about umbrella species and focal species and keystone species. Each of these terms has a slightly different meaning, but the umbrella species and the focal species and the keystone species all often are large, wide-ranging carnivores. And if you protect enough habitat for, say, grizzly bears, gray wolves, and cougars, you're probably – because these are very wide-ranging, uh, relatively sensitive species. If you're protecting enough habitat for these top carnivores, you're probably also protecting enough habitat for the songbirds, the trout, uh, the, the butterflies, the dragonflies, and so forth. So that's the reason for the term umbrella species. It's, it's meant to imply – that you're casting a, a wide um, protective umbrella that shelters the many species beneath it. So I completely agree with that, and I love it, and I you know love all of you for for promoting it. But I have been questioning that the last few years, and I, this is something that I have. I don't know how how useful this will be in the radio interview, but this is something that I have been wondering for a few years now, and that's. I know this is too small to say this, but I live on 40 acres of second growth redwood that is being fiercely protected by by me. <laughs> and, you know, it's completely organic here in terms of I don't do anything. I just I mean, I don't touch the I don't touch anything. It's all just recovering on its own. And even still, and once again, I know 40 acres is tiny, but even still, I'm seeing a collapse of populations of uh, daddy long legs, um, sow bugs. And my point is that 40 acres should be enough to protect a sow bug, I would think. You think, yeah. And I've been reading that even invertebrate populations are collapsing worldwide. Mm. And I'm wondering, I completely agree. And I, I, I mean, I hope you're understanding. I hope I'm making clear that I think that the entire world should be protected. You know, it's not... So I'm not questioning whether we should protect for large species. I'm just wondering if because of ubiquitous pollution, if it ends up the protecting for a bear might not end up protecting sow bugs because th so many other things have been so messed up. Yeah. Do, do you see what I'm trying to ask? I do, and I guess I would say using the umbrella species – Which is not to say we shouldn't do it, of course. Right. Yeah, and I guess I'd say using the umbrella species concept for conservation planning is useful but not necessarily sufficient because, yeah, as you say, there may be some smaller species that are actually more sensitive to environmental pollutants than the larger species. And, you know, and I think any almost any conservation biologist, including the, the ones I've worked with, Reed Noss, Michael Sule, and so forth, would, they would readily admit we're, um, our, our efforts at conservation planning are very far from perfect. The safest principles are the the more and the wilder the better. You know, the more the better connected habitats are, the bigger they are, the wilder they are, the better. But even then, there are a lot of uncertainties. And protecting a, a jaguar in Mexico, say, it means protecting a great deal of habitat. But if there are some little known pollutants, perhaps pesticides, which are not well regulated in Mexico out there, they may be they may be harming smaller species that we don't even notice. Yeah, and I want to be really clear that in no way am I criticizing the, these efforts. I, I think that's the way it needs to go. It's just I've been – I'm simply saying this because I have been extremely disheartened over the past – I've lived in this place for 15 years and have assiduously protected it. And I've been really disheartened to see even tiny creatures – um, collapsing here where you would think, you know, I, I don't know, but I'm guessing a sow bug has a, has a habitat of what, 20 square feet, 50 square feet, yeah. hundred square feet. Yeah, that's that. And it's, it's, it's scaring the hell out of me. Yeah. Well, I wonder if there's some herbicides or other pesticides out there that are, that are doing real damage. We're starting to learn most famously from the monarch. Yeah. That, Many insects, including migratory ones, and there are a lot more migratory insects than people realize, by the way. And insects are another reason why we need to protect habitat corridors. Quite a few butterflies and dragonflies migrate considerable, considerable distances. And many of these insects probably are quite sensitive to, to uh, poisonous chemicals. Uh, you know, Rachel Carson warned us decades and decades ago, and I think most of the 
evidence since then has been strongly in support of what she argued. Yes, and dragonflies, where I live, in the last 15 years, dragonflies have completely collapsed. They were... Um, there's a pond right near my house, and there were probably... At the right times of year, I could see easily a hundred dragonflies in the air at a time, and now I see maybe five or ten. Yeah. Um, and I didn't. The reason I didn't mention them is because I also knew they migrated. So I also don't understand how migratory creatures are surviving at all. Because you know, it's one thing. There's bears. There's a lot of bears where I live, and you know, they can have a fairly small compared to a migratory songbird. You know, a bear might need what 50 square miles, 100 square miles, 10 square miles. Right. And migratory songbirds require land to be preserved in northern California, in southern California, in northern Mexico, in Panama, and in Venezuela. Yeah. It's actually a wonder that our continent still has as much wildlife as it has, given all the insults we've heaped at it. But what with habitat fragmentation, outright destruction, roads, dams, pollution climate chaos. It's really a wonder there's that much wildlife left, and I worry that we may see it start to disappear a lot more quickly in the coming decades. There may be a big extinction debt yet to pay, as some biologists like E.O. Wilson have warned. Yeah, that that terrifies me. So, can you talk a little bit about the... Uh, we've talked about corridors sort of, th sort of theoretically. Can you talk about what you mean by I mean, give me some examples of both the eastern and western um, wild ways that you would like to see in place. Sure. Well, as I just said about habitat in general, the safest rule with wildlife corridors is the wider and the wilder, the better. So a wildlife corridor can be something as narrow as a small stream with a little, uh, a little buffer of native trees alongside it, or it can be something as broad as a mountain range, or it can even be something as broad as is the Rocky Mountains, which is a series of mountain ranges. And again, the wider and the wilder, the better. Um, just to give a couple of examples, the go a goal of the Wildlands Network and the Rewilding Institute, the Rewilding Institute is a think tank started by Dave Foreman a few years ago, and I'm involved in that as well as with the Wildlands Network. Um, both Wildlands Network and Rewilding Institute kindred groups have been um, – promoting the idea of protecting an eastern wildway or an Atlantic wildway or an Appalachian wildway. We use different names for it. But the idea would be it wouldn't be all wilderness by any means. It wouldn't be all public land by any means. It would probably, in fact, be mostly private land, and probably most of it would have a degree of protection less than what is given to wilderness and national parks. But we would hope that in a broad swath reaching from southern Florida along the southeast coastal plain, through the Appalachians, through the Adirondacks, and on up to the Gaspé Peninsula in Quebec, we would hope that across a broad swath there would be a, a, a robust series of national parks and wilderness areas linked by wildlife corridors, smaller wildlife corridors, and then buffered by private lands that have conservation easements on them or where private landowners have agreed to practice good stewardship with, with voluntary agreements. And it would probably still have roads and towns and varying population levels, but the goal within a continental wildway, as we call this sort of continental scale wildlife corridor, would be to give as much protection as possible to as much land as possible and to, and to somehow mitigate the, the biggest barriers to wildlife movement, especially the roads and dams. So where there is a major east-west running road going through the Appalachian Mountains, you'd want to put wildlife crossings on it tunnels under or bridges over or both so that animals can cross safely. Now, within that broader continental wildway, there would be many examples of small wildlife corridors. And one I work on almost daily here in the Adirondacks where I live when I'm not traveling farther afield, we call Split Rock Wildway. It's a um, local to regional scale wildlife corridor linking Lake Champlain through the West Champlain Hills to the high peaks in the highest part of the Adirondacks. It's mostly private land, some of which is now protected by conservation easement, but it also includes some blocks of public land. And about five or six different land trusts and conservation advocacy groups are working to protect this area, doing outreach to landowners, working on property tax reform so that landowners can afford to do the right thing, um, trying to get speed limits lowered on sensitive 
sections of road, looking at where we might get safe crossings on major roads, trying to improve water quality for trout and salmon. A whole, uh, whole suite of measures we're taking to try to protect the 15 to 20,000 acres that connects uh, Lake Champlain with the high peaks through this range of hills. So that's an example of a, a local to regional scale wildlife corridor um, it was set within a much larger continental wildway. In the Rocky Mountain West, uh, the Wildlands Network and Bee Wilding Institute have been proposing a spine of the continent conservation corridor or a western wildway. And in the West, there's a lot more public land and quite a bit more wildland in most areas. So there's a better chance there to just get strong levels of protection on the public land and on the smaller amounts of private land. Again, give landowners strong incentives to allow animals to move through their land, to practice good stewardship, and to try to keep as much of the Rocky Mountains as wild as possible. So in places where you've seen parts of this implemented, have you... Um, what sort of results have you seen? Well, here in Split Rock Wildland, I basically live in this little wildlife corridor in the eastern Adirondacks. I've been seeing seeing more and more of the of the sensitive, shy, wide ranging species, the focal species like black bear, bobcat, fisher, mink, uh, brook trout, bald eagle, osprey, peregrine falcon. I see more and more of those animals since we've been starting to protect this area. So. And I, a number of my colleagues and friends have noticed this as well. We're just seeing more wildlife. And I know anecdotally that many of these sensitive wide-ranging species, again, including bobcat, river otter, black bear, fisher, and so forth, are using this wildlife corridor. I have, a, I have like you, Derek, I, I serve as a volunteer guardian of a piece of land. I bought 55 acres with help from my folks many years ago, and I... Established as a wildlife sanctuary, donated a forever wild easement to the Northeast Wilderness Trust, and now I have a little cabin on the land, but most of it's just strictly protected as, as wildlife habitat, and, and it includes a beaver pond and wetlands and so forth. And I see many of these sensitive animals moving through. So I know the wildlife corridor is working, and there are plenty of other examples of, of where wildlife corridors are being successfully implemented and animals are managing to, to range widely as they need to. And, you know, one of the things that strikes me, well, you know, the the one piece of, as you know from my work and as you know probably from the real world, um, you know, I'm not very optimistic. I am I despair almost every moment of every day. And the one thing that really gives me any, whatever optimism I have is 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 it goes back to what you said earlier about how it's extraordinary that so much life is still alive considering yeah. what's been done to it but that's actually the one thing that gives me some optimism is how desperately life wants to live it's right yeah um you know if yeah. we just if we just give them one of the things i mean that i'm very concerned about the sow bugs the daddy long legs all all of them but that doesn't alter the fact that um, in the 15 years since I've been here, the way this forest has come back has been um, stunning and magnificent. Yeah. And I'm sure it's the same there. That if you just if you just if you just tell the land, look, you're never gonna your children will not be cut for timber. Yeah. Um, it's extraordinary how many more babies the trees have. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I mean, it's just, that, I, I don't know. Do you want to say anything about any of that? Well, I agree. That's, the resilience of wild nature is what keeps me going. If, if nature were not so resilient, I would have given in to despair long ago. And as you say, give wild things a chance and they will blossom and they will run and they will fly in, a way, in ways that just defy our expectations and even our imaginations. They're, they're amazingly resilient, most creatures are. Many, many are sensitive too, I, and I don't want to over... You have to be careful in emphasizing that resilience because many animals are truly, truly sensitive and, and will go extinct soon if we don't better protect their habitat, many plants also. But, there, you know, wolves have made it back into, into many parts of the... Um, have, have made it back, I should say many, have made it back into some parts of the western United States and eastern Canada on their own and 
Cougars are trying to reclaim old habitats in the east. They're not making it because so far only the males are making the dispersals and they're not finding mates. And so eventually they get shot or hit by cars. But these these wide-ranging animals, especially the carnivores, cougars, wolves, bears, and so forth, they're making truly heroic journeys. I'm looking forward to the first skilled author who writes a book about wilderness wanders, showing the glories of these amazing young creatures that light out for the territory. I mean, sadly, most of the stories end in tragedy. But if, if people would learn to be a little bit kinder, practice a little more restraint, learn how to coexist, we wouldn't really have to so drastically change the way we live to be able to accommodate these wild creatures. I do, in fact, think that quite radical changes are needed in our economy because I think our economy is almost inherently destructive. But as individuals, we wouldn't necessarily have to make all that many uh, drastic changes in the near term to accommodate these wide-ranging animals and other sensitive species. So, yeah, the, the resilience of nature gives me hope. I also, this is a a bit darker way of looking at it. I have a feeling that in the face of a, an unraveling climate, nature may prove more resilient than some of the sensitive aspects of our civilization, like agriculture. It's nothing, well, we, nothing we can bank on, and that's not a cheery thought, because if agriculture starts to fail, uh, many, many of us are going to go hungry. But I, but I do think that nature may prove a, a, at least a little bit more resilient in the face of climate chaos than maybe some of our own institutions. Yeah, this we're th this culture really is a house of cards, and I'm kind of surprised it's lasted as long as it has. Um, yeah, and I, I agree with everything you're saying, and yeah, I, I want to be clear too that when I'm saying that life really wants to live, and it's extraordinary um, how, how much it... Um, how much life wants to live, I want to be really clear that I'm not trying to give any support to the sort of neo-environmental idea that, um, that you know, that, that's one of the things that uh, a lot of anti-environmentalists say is, oh yeah, nature's really resilient. They'll just, you know, there's this, this great line by Kathleen Dean Moore where she talks about how um, there was a Exxon Mobil ad or some sort of oil company ad that said, Nature's a tough old gal, and um, or Mother Earth is a is a tough old gal, and her response to that was was fabulous. She said, "If if the Earth really were your mother this way, she would hold you under the water until you until bubbles came out of your nose." <laughs> it's like, um, which which I think, yeah. Anyway, I don't want to give support to the idea that the fact that life wants to live means that you can go ahead and keep destroying it, which is how a lot of people would take it. So, right. um, well, I, again, I entirely agree with you, Derek. Because, yeah, I mean, some form of life will probably survive whatever awful things human beings do to the earth, but it probably won't be the species we most want to see. And it, to my mind, it would be an utter unthinkable tragedy if the world were reduced to a small number of small species and we lost the grand whales and bears and raptors and dragonflies and butterflies and songbirds. That would just be awful. Well, one of the ways I talk about this, when people say this at my talks, they say, oh, life can't be – I mean the earth isn't being murdered. What I always do is I say, give me a knife and somebody in the audience will give me a knife and I walk up to the person who said that and I say, give me your hand. And I'm like, why? And I say, I'm not going to kill you. I'm just going to cut off your finger. I'm going to cut off your hand, and then I'm going to cut off your arm. And by the way, if when I pull out your heart, that's not actually going to kill you because bacteria survive. <laughs> and you know, people get the point. And um, so anyway, the, the the what I want to get back to is the, the wildlife corridor. So, what are um, what are your future? What would you like to see happen in this direction? You've sort of laid it out. What what um, Given that things are generally going the wrong direction, you have this grand plan for protecting. How is your plan succeeding insofar as it is your collective plan succeeding insofar as it is given how horrible um, this culture is in general? I mean it seems that you are making a magnificent effort. How is it working at all? It's actually an interesting, very friendly debate, uh, informal debate between Michael Sule and Dave Foreman. It's not, not that they're literally debating, but there's sort of an ongoing friendly discussion about whether 
in promoting these continental wildways, promoting the spine of the continent, saying that we should protect the Rocky Mountains and keep them intact for bears and wolves and cougars and hikers and bird watchers and the rest, whether we should try to um, build a national campaign or even an international campaign to do that, or if, or whether we should just quietly, as effectively as possible, keep saving pieces of nature one after another and link them. And and Dave is pessimistic about the present political landscape to feel that national campaigns are probably not likely to succeed, especially not ones led by small bands of little known underfunded activists like ourselves. We don't have anything close to the resources of the larger conservation groups. And even the larger conservation groups have nothing like the resources of the extractive corporations. And on the other hand, Michael Sule feels, and I hope I'm not um, misrepresenting either Dave's or Michael's views. I don't think I am. They're both close friends and I work with them both, but I, I could be misunderstanding. But as, if I understand them correctly, Dave thinks national campaigns at this point are not likely to succeed. Just keep doing the very best you can at a grassroots level, tie the efforts together, um, support the regional and local conservation groups and make sure their efforts tie together. Michael would like to see a national campaign, a high-profile national campaign for uh, a, a national conservation and recreation corridor along the Rocky Mountains and w where the habitat would be wide enough, intact enough to support the full range of native species, including carnivores, but also where quiet forms of recreation, um, um, appropriate forms of recreation are encouraged, hiking, paddling, wildlife watching, and so forth. Michael thinks we have a better chance of achieving a continental wildlife through the Rockies if we do mount a, a national campaign or initiative. So it's an interesting little d debate there. I, and I find myself ag somehow agreeing with both Dave and Michael. I think they're both right. I think we probably have to continue to support every grassroots effort to protect a wild place we can, make sure those efforts are tied together, but also see if we can build support for a national campaign to protect the potential wildlife corridors at, a, at, a, at least a national scale, if not at an international scale, and involving a wider cross-section of people than we've included before, not just hardcore conservationists like us, but also hikers and skiers and backpackers and river runners, and, and, and yes, hunters and fishers too. And, and, and anybody who cares about wild nature ought to want to see connectivity protected across the continent, and especially where we still have a relative, where it would still be, be quite feasible to do so without major restoration efforts. You know, one of the things that has always kind of surprised me is in some places, um, like when I lived in northeastern Washington, hunters were sometimes really supportive of the environmental community there, and that always made perfect sense to me. I mean, even if you're going to go shoot the deer or the elk, they've got to have habitat in order for you to shoot them in the first place. It's, it's, it seems a no-brainer to me. Um, but where I live now is the politics are kind of Mississippi on the north coast, and it's just – it's horribly uh, – one of our – this is to let you know everything you need to know about the local politics. One of our local supervisors, um, county supervisors, has actually written an essay um, in which he was arguing – he was complaining that white people no longer get to call black people colored. <laughs> I mean this is how bad the politics are here. I saw a bumper sticker the other day that said, proud supporter of Port Orford Cedar Root Rot. And Port Orford Cedar Root Rot is a root rot that is killing Port Orford Cedar, which is an endangered species. Yeah. And it's killing it because um, basically the way it moves around is off-road vehicle people drive their off-road vehicles. And then they get the mud that has the fungus, the root rot on it. And then they carry that to some other place. So the point is he's a proud supporter of that. Yeah. And in this county, the hunters are pretty uh, – I mean it stuns me that – and I think this is true in some other places. What the, the, the short way to ask this question is it sometimes stuns me when hunters don't support wildlife protection. Yeah, right. They certainly should. And, and in, historically, they did. And, and hunters can rightly claim that many of the conservation gains made in the 20th century, and I think even dating back to the 19th century, were made because of hunters, conservation-minded conservation hunters, 
I'm afraid, unfortunately, that has changed quite a bit in recent years. There's certainly many conservation-minded hunters and anglers out there, probably a greater proportion of anglers, actually. Yeah. <clears throat> but too many of the hunters really do fit the label slob hunter. They get around on their ATVs. They don't want to hike. They use high-powered rifles. It's a, it's a highly technological activity now, and they're going for trophy animals. And that's the opposite of natural selection. Hunters should be happy to take out the weaker members of the herd, not go for the strongest members. And the, you know, the natural predators generally prey on the weak, the sick, and the elderly, and, the, and sometimes the calves too. And that makes a lot more sense than taking out the, the biggest bull or the strongest mother. It just is not right to be targeting the strongest members of a herd. So I, I, I think hunter, hunters, just, I, I, I can support appropriate hunting and fishing, but I'm afraid that many of today's modern hunters are not very conscientious and are not very supportive of conservation and all too often are opposed to the recovery of missing species like wolves and cougars. So one of the things that seems really positive about everything you're saying about um, about these these ways of protecting wildlife corridors is like you said, people can still live there. And so do you get... I brought up the question about sort of that overt nature hating as a contrast to this next question of do you get a lot of people who say, um, you know, when you approach them to say, so would you mind protecting, you know, five acres out of your 20 or, you know, 10 acres along the stream or something like that? Do you find a lot of people basically saying, oh, hell yeah, that's that sounds fun? Well, it. it where I live in the Adirondacks, there are certainly quite a few landowners who are happy to conserve their land if they can afford to do so. And I've traveled widely across the wilder parts of North America, and I think I've seen this elsewhere, too. Most people, there are some people who, for reasons I cannot understand, actually basically seem to be anti-nature, anti-conservation, anti-science. I don't understand that. I'm the I'm afraid some of the Tea Party types are that way. And I cannot understand those people at all. And frankly, I'm not sure there's a whole lot of point arguing with them. Because I don't think they're going to change – well, they're certainly not going to change my mind, and I'm not going to change their mind. But I think most Americans, most Mexicans, most Canadians, and North Americans certainly the continent I know best, do care about nature and do think that our natural heritage should be conserved and passed on intact to – uh, future generations. If you were to do a poll, and I think this ought to be done periodically, about whether we ought to protect the natural heritage of our country, I think the vast majority of people would say yes, we should. Even, and I think they would say so, even if it's were said in the poll question that some sacrifices might have to be made. Unfortunately, people are not generally all that well informed ecologically. They don't know the effects that their machines may have on nature. For instance, they don't know the effects that roads and dams have on nature. For instance, but I think that most people mean well and actually do want to see nature protected. So give landowners a chance to do the right thing, make it affordable for them to do right, the right thing, and many, perhaps even most of them, will. Unfortunately, right now, financial pressures tend to make it difficult to do the right thing, and I know this as a landowner myself. I don't get any sort of tax break for conserving my land. If I wanted a tax break, I would actually have to log it, ironically. So that our tax system, our tax system, and also other economic pressures in our society tend to make it difficult to do the right thing, and tend to reward doing the wrong thing. That is, subdividing land for development, or liquidating the timber, or putting too many livestock out on it. That's how you make money. We should change things so that people are actually somehow or other paid, or at least rewarded in some way, for conserving their land, for for protecting wildlife, for keeping habitat intact, for allowing nature to continue to provide ecosystem services, although I think we have to be careful about using utilitarian arguments too much, and for um, helping stabilize the climate. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. And right now, as we're speaking, there are basically neighbors on two sides of me who are clear-cutting their land. And so I, I don't know why. I don't actually know either of these neighbors. I'm I, I'm guessing it's because of the economy and they – they, or one of them actually owes back taxes and he's cutting the trees to pay taxes. Yeah. And so you're right. That would be great to change the subsidy. So so basically 
um, we have just a couple minutes left, and um, I'm wondering, you know, one of the things, the, the reason I do this whole radio series is because I want for people to, to, to do something. And what can people do if they live in um, Colorado or if they live in Kansas or if they live in upstate New York or if they live in Oregon or if they live in Nova Scotia? What can they do to um, help both uh, wildlife, the idea of wildlife corridors in general, and what can they do locally to help wildlife, um, to help either create or participate in a local wildlife corridor? Yeah, m many things. And years ago, Dave Foreman said that piecing together a wildlife corridor or a large wilderness area or a big national park is a bit like assembling a jigsaw puzzle. You have on the box, uh, the jigsaw puzzle box, you have the picture. That's, the, that's what you're aiming for. You're trying to put together that picture. Doing so actually involves putting hundreds of different pieces in place many different people are going to put different pieces in place. So you sort of have to have the big picture in mind. And that's what Wildlands Network and the Lee Wild Institute are trying to provide. And then you work with many different individuals and land trusts and conservation advocacy groups and conservation biologists to put those pieces in place. Just to give a few examples of things people can do. If they own land, they could consider working with a land trust to put a conservation easement on that land. In some cases, there are actually economic benefits to, to donating conservation easements to land trusts. In fact, there often are. I don't want to make it sound like you're always punished for conserving land. In some cases, you can be rewarded for it. Not often enough, but land trusts are working to make it more affordable for landowners to donate conservation easements. Find out who are the, again, the land trusts in your area, the conservation advocacy groups in the area. Support them with donations of time or tools or money or expertise. Um, write to your elected officials telling them that you support protecting and restoring missing species like wolf and cougar and grizzly bear, depending on where you live or depending on what area concerns you the most. Write letters to your local newspaper advocating for protection of wildlife corridors. And, of course, you know, depending on where you live, figuring out where the animals are trying to move. Very often animals want to move along streams. And streams, if we could do little else in the near term, we would do a lot of good for this country by um, better protecting and buffering our, our waterways. And that benefits tra salmon, trout, and other aquatic species, but it also benefits wide-ranging mammals because they often travel along streams. So in, in getting involved in a, in a river watch group or a river advocacy group can be very effective. And just generally talking about your values. If you love wild animals, talk about it with your neighbors because I think one of our biggest challenges now is wildlife just isn't in the news that much. And if it is, it's often a, a, a sad story about elephants being poached or something. It's not, it's not very often that we hear stories that empower us to take action on behalf of wild animals. I think, that ma I think many, perhaps most people on this continent, actually do love wild animals in some way. And I think we need to talk about our love for wild things much more, share those values, and find ways we can work together to restore habitat for for our neighbors. Well, thank you for saying all that. And once again, thank you for your your decades of work. You have you have as I said, as I sort of said before we started this this turned on the tape recorder, um, you know, you've been one of my heroes for literally for decades now. And and thank you for that work. Thank you, Derek. I've been admiring your work for a, a very long time. I hope to, hope to meet you in person before too long. Keep up the keep up the good work for wild things. Oh, thank you. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been John Davis. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. <laughs>